I just thought no one was going to believe me. I was assaulted by my gynecologist. I was molested by Robert Haddon in 1993. Two days before the birth of my son, he sexually assaulted me. What is shocking to me is how little accountability there has been. Yeah, hi, Lori. It's Dr. Haddon calling. You know, I just got word that you called the office and you're upset and they were calling the police. What, what the heck happened? What, what's going on? That's a voicemail from Laurie Kenyak's then gynecologist, Columbia University Dr. Robert Haddon, when he left just hours after sexually assaulting her at a postpartum checkup. Please, can, can we talk? I'm very upset. I, I don't know what, what's going on. So please, if, please call me back. There was no one else in the room. I was naked in a paper gown, and here's a man that had the guts to orally assault me. All these things go through your mind. Who do I speak to? How do I get out of here? Who's going to believe me? It's my word against his. But Ken Yock's word was the truth. She contacted the police and set off a decade-long struggle for justice. A disgraced doctor will be trading in his hospital scrubs for a prison jumpsuit. Robert Haddon was sentenced to 20 years behind bars today. In the end, it wasn't just her word against his. More than 700 women came forward to say they, too, were abused by the OBGYN over the course of his 25-year career. Five of them shared their stories with us. I think at that moment I was frozen and I couldn't do anything or say anything. The way I want to be remembered is that I did say something. Do you feel like he manipulated the system? Or do you feel like the system was set up in a way that just made this type of predatory abusive behavior easily achieved in this context? I think he picked a system where he knew he could use it to his advantage. Mm -hmm. He was opportunistic, but he was methodical. Sometimes there were people in the room, sometimes there wasn't. Was he really using gloves? No. Yeah, no. Is that possible? Like, you would question it, but then he would, he would keep moving through it. In 2023, Haddon was sentenced to 20 years in prison after federal prosecutors proved he'd sexually abused patients between 1987 and 2012. The abuse was inexcusable the moment it began. But these former patients say Columbia had the chance to stop it years ago. I was molested by Robert Haddon in 1993. I wrote a letter of complaint to Columbia University detailing what he did. And the acting head of OBGYN wrote back and said, we'll be investigating this thoroughly. And he never contacted me again. In Diane Monson's 1994 letter reviewed by NBC News, she cited a number of troubling irregularities, including an unusually long breast exam and a pap smear that left her feeling violated. I did try to speak up when it happened in the hospital and I was just told that I was overreacting, that it had to do with me just giving birth a few hours before. If we really want to move forward from this, we need to be able to reflect on what happened, how it happened, and how we can prevent it from happening again. I shouldn't have been assaulted. I shouldn't be sitting here right now. Days after Laurie Kenyak spoke to the police, Haddon was allowed to return to work, seeing patients with a chaperone in the exam room. I would have friends call the office to try to make a fake appointment to, to just gauge how much longer they were going to allow this to happen. The next month, Haddon went on leave, and he never returned to work at Columbia. But four years went by before he was forced to give up his medical license, and four more before federal prosecutors got involved. Kenyak settled with Columbia in 2018. I was told I was the only one that's ever mentioned this to anybody. They told me. You're a single mom and a dancer. This is a lot of money for you. Go raise your daughter. The arrogance in that, as if they had done me this huge favor. When the reality was they'd failed to protect you in the first place. They'd had a heads up, a very detailed heads up, and they just ignored it. More than 220 survivors have now settled with Columbia. The ones we've spoken to say it's not enough. I feel like no amount of money it's going to make me feel comfortable when I walk in a, in a clinic. A spokesperson for Columbia University Irving Medical Center says the institution is taking a series of actions to, quote, repair and rebuild trust, including committing to an external investigation 
notifying former patients that Haddon was convicted, establishing a $100 million survivor settlement fund and reviewing its patient safety protocols. The spokesperson says Columbia, quote, recognizes that it was a failure not to take these actions earlier and is committed to charting a new path forward. How has this experience changed the way you all approach getting medical care? Completely. For me, I think I can come with two hands the amount of times I've seen a doctor since I was 18 till now, and I just don't trust doctors. Going to gynecologists after that, I never told the doctors why it was traumatic. I just, it was always like a meltdown. Would I have had more children? Maybe, but I avoided OBGYNs, I avoided doctors. That is something that he and Columbia very tangibly took from us. Reflecting back on it, Haddon did a lot of sexual grooming over the years. What do you mean by that? The grooming behavior was the very long breast exams, checking to see if you have moles. We're asking you uh, questions about your sex life. He was my first OBGYN, so I didn't have the standard of care or kind of the information. He didn't care if your spouse was there, your mom was there, the chaperone was there. He had the ways to do it for no one to notice. I feel like something really important for institutions to do, and Columbia certainly to do, is to educate women and girls with actually written material that explains this is the sequence of, of what will happen in your exam so that there's some way of knowing what's normal. In 2022, several of the women abused by Haddon lobbied for passage of the Adult Survivors Act in New York, which gave victims of sexual assault a one-year window to sue their abusers, regardless of how long ago the assault happened but the window closed last November. There shouldn't be no expiration day on you coming forward on, on an abuse that you suffer. What would be your message to another person, another young woman? If there was a patient of Haddon and you're watching and you're listening, you are most likely abused. Every single appointment that he had with a woman was um, an intention to abuse. Reach out to us, don't be afraid, you're not alone. There are currently at least 20 civil lawsuits that were filed under that Adult Survivors Act here in New York, still pending against Robert Haddon. But one important caveat there, survivors are not eligible for a payout from Columbia's new $100 million settlement fund if they've previously settled with the university or filed any legal claims related to the former doctor. Lawyers for Haddon did not respond to NBC's multiple requests for comment. Tom? Ellison, there's such powerful accounts here, and you, you cannot believe that this happened over decades. Um, from your conversations with these survivors, do you get a sense that they have any hope, any belief that the system will change? You know, I asked them that, and some of them said, maybe not in our lifetime, but what they're hoping is that it'll change for the next generation, for their children. You have to remember, all of these women, they're parents now, and they have children at different ages, and so many of them talked about having a daughter themselves, having to share their story with them as they approach their teen years, and also try to give them guidance they didn't have about what a visit with an OBGYN is supposed to look like, because it's uncomfortable for every woman to begin with, and sometimes you don't know what is normal, what is not, or you second guess yourself. So they're trying to eliminate that. They also say there was a protest at Columbia with medical students. Mm -hmm. They'd heard there were gonna be about 30 people wearing their white coats as a silent protest for the new president who was uh, being honored, inaugurated, if you will. And when they got there, they said hundreds of current medical students showed up to be a part of that silent protest. And they said that moment, was the one throughout all of this that gave them hope that maybe things will change because with the next generation of doctors, maybe they will do something differently. There were so many impactful moments from that interview, and I know you spent a lot of time with these five women. Mm -hmm. um, what's going to stay with you? You know, it's mind-boggling to just think how many of them looked at each other and they have this support system together, but the reality still is that there was that one woman, Diane Monson, who we spoke to, who said, I reported this in 1994. None of these other women had to be here. And the pain of that is something that is hard to get out of your head, but there's also just this amazing courage and optimism amongst these women about changing things, moving forward, and continuing on being good moms, living their life despite the trauma that they went through. And Haddon is in jail now, 
but there is still a lot they believe that Columbia needs to do to prevent this in the future, and also other medical institutions need to take a look at. Allison Barber, uh, I want to thank you and the, the team, the investigative team, all the producers that put that together. That was really a powerful report, and also those women that were so brave to come forward and share that story, because that's not easy either. Allison, we thank you for that, okay? Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.